Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Engaging the Phenomenon. And uh, here, this is Crash Retrieval Week. And of course, today for Crash Retrieval Week, I have none other than uh, Michael Schratt, who is an aerospace historian. And, and I'm going to dub him UFO Crash Retrieval Expert. Um, he, he's, he's, done, he's done a lot of great presentations on, uh, on crash retrievals that you can find on YouTube. And uh, here today, uh, Michael is going to give uh, another excellent uh, slideshow presentation of crash retrieval. So welcome, Michael. Good to be with you, James. It's, it's really a pleasure to have you here. Mm -hmm. um, so um, without further ado, uh, Michael, take the floor. Okay. Well, uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to uh, be with you here this evening. And uh, what I've done is I've assembled these cases in chronological order by date. So we're going to start from the earliest and go all the way to the latest that we've got. Uh, the title of this presentation is Retrievals of the Third Kind, Cosmic Crashes, Corpses, and Cover-Ups. Ultimately, this is actually an homage to the work of Leonard Stringfield. I want to certainly give him credit. Um, and you know that's what we're going to dive into here tonight. And really, I kind of start here crash retrieval is it, it's the ultimate holy grail of ufo research because the crash retrievals contain the body the debris and the craft themselves and at this point in this whole game here i don't think anything less than physical evidence is going to move this field forward you know we've been waiting 80 years now we've been trying to do this the democratic process and you can see how that process is somewhat faltering lately and so yes. it's now up to us to step up to the game and really identify the last of these legacy crash retrieval witnesses and have them come forward. That's what we're that's what we need to do at this point. You know, it's like I said, uh, we're, we're beyond rushing and racing the undertaker. Uh, this is the final curtain call on crash retrievals. It, it's got to happen now or it's not going to happen. That's why these cases are so important here. Uh, I'm just going to run through a couple of quick announcements and then give you source material where, where this information came from. So the content of each case highlighted in this presentation has remained intact for the description of the original source. The identity of firsthand sources will be protected per Leonard Stringfield's original agreement with his military contacts. Number three, the visual aids used in this presentation are computer generated forensic composite illustrations and sketches, which originated from the specific detail by provided, uh, provided by Leonard sources. And this is the, the first-hand military witnesses of where Leonard got this information. Three-star U.S. Air Force generals, U.S. Air Force fighter pilots, astronauts, commercial pilots, air traffic controllers, neurosurgeons, pathologists, theoretical physicists and mathematicians, U.S. Army officers, U.S. Navy officers, military police, high-level Pentagon officials, top military brass, scientists and engineers who worked at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base and other government facilities. So when people want to know where Leonard got the sources for this, these are the sources here. These are the caliber of witnesses that Leonard was dealing with here. A couple of quick quotes. Number one, UFO crash retrievals can't be real because if they were, I would have read about it in the local newspaper. Number two, there are not now, nor ever have been, any extraterrestrial visitors or equipment on Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. So it's going to be Leonard's witnesses against the United States Air Force. That's this kind of a interesting, uh, you could call it, I wouldn't call it an actual fight, but it's, it's, a, uh, it's a race to the evidence, actually. Here is Leonard Stringfield. This is the man of the hour here. He passed away in 94. I'll go over a couple of uh, bio points here. Born in 1920, he grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio. By the time he graduated from high school in 1939, he already memorized the entire dictionary. So, you know, intelligent guy, the, the right kind of guy to compile these cases here. Joined the military as soon as he heard about the attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941. After the war, he was employed by a chemical company in Ohio and retired after 30 years. He wrote two books, Inside Saucer Post 3-0, that was in 1957. The other book, Situation Red, the UFO Siege, that was in 1977. 
His lecture on UFO crash retrievals at the 1978 MUFON Symposium in Dayton, Ohio, actually did cause an international sensation. And that's because um, this was the first time these had been basically exposed and talked about in kind of a group setting where there was more than one. So there were 12 cases examined. This was all virgin material at the time. People really hadn't heard about this. Um, Roswell was just sort of coming into the play here. And so the, the catch 22 is that the agreements that Leonard made with his sources is that he could tell the story and maintain an important part of our national history, but he was not allowed to release their identities. And so that's why there was this pushback at the MUFON Symposium. He passed away December 18th, 1994. And so that's just kind of a, a brief bio of Leonard here. Um, since well, and uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but for, for people watching this, we're actually recording it on December 18th right now. So <laughs> it's the, yeah. you know, third 29, 29 year anniversary of his passing. So we're okay, honoring him right. Yeah, I guess that's the case here. Isn't that interesting? Uh, Cincinnati Inquirer, July 19th, 1993. Uh, author continues quest for truth about UFOs. What I've collected has staggering implications for mankind. This would be the biggest thing since Christ, really. Yeah, uh, I, I agree, because if we can get to the physical evidence, the hard physical evidence, the body, the debris, the craft, even the autopsy reports, the eight by 10 black and white glossy photographs, the uh, motion picture film reel, all of that constitutes this physical evidence if we can get that information and evidence handed over to the scientific community as a united coalition, we're going to go a long way at bringing this out rather than dragging our, the heels of the government for another 80 years. So that's why this has to happen now. Uh, I want to recommend this book to anyone who's interested in this subject matter. UFO Crash Retrievals, The Complete Investigation, all of his status reports by Leonard Stringfield, 1978 to 1994. It, it's a rather thick book. It's not for the faint of heart. It goes into all of the specific details on the crash retrievals, the bodies, the debris, where the saucers were kept, where they were stored, where they were shipped, where they were moved, how many bodies were recovered, all of the intricate details. Uh, you can get this on Amazon. It's $100. It's worth every penny. But the problem is, it is almost completely devoid of sketches, drawings, illustrations, full color renderings, refined drawings. You know, it, it's a great book, but it, it, it has virtually no visual aid. So for the past three years, I've had this crusade to go through this book with a fine tooth comb, pick out the most mission critical cases, and then commission very detailed pencil drawings that we're going to show tonight here and then commission full color renderings in an effort to preserve an important part of our national history by, by making these cases come alive. That's the goal in this whole campaign here. So let, let's go to Vegas really quickly here. And uh, would you go to Vegas if you knew that the odds were 119 to one in your favor? We've got 119 crash retrieval cases. We only need one to be correct. And it, it proves our case. So in, in point of fact, the odds are in our favor. You know, we always have this United States military, the government, political leaders, they're telling us that we don't have any evidence and, and there is no such thing as crash retrievals. Well, we've got 119 cases, military witnesses that say otherwise. Uh, and, you know, just to reinforce the point, all we need is one of these to be authentic and correct. And the whole concept of Non-reality of crash retrievals completely falls apart. So honestly, the, the odds are in our favor. I want to give credit to Rudy Gardea. He's my artist who did all the pencil sketches. And I want to start here with this case right here. This is 1942 at an army base north of Georgia. I don't know where it is. Leonard didn't know where it was. Uh, this is page 319. It was about 15 feet in diameter. It was 10 feet high. And I'm going to start at the top, uh, at the upper section, which you see in this uh, enlarged view at the top, there was a control panel with buttons and switches and dials and levers. Below that, which we call level two, 
there was what looked like four bar stools that were posted just aft of a wraparound window. So that was level two. Level three had this entryway hatch door and there were four ETs taken alive. They were about five foot tall, oversized head, oversized eyes, slit for a mouth. A lot of these cases have a one piece tight fitting flight suit. Uh, they had milky white skin. And uh, what was also interesting is that wrapped around the outer circumference of the lower portion of this craft were these hieroglyphic type writing. That's something we see again and again here. This is 1942. We're talking about five years before Roswell here. Uh, here's a blow up of these lettering and these hieroglyphic symbols. Now, I don't know if this is exactly what they look like, but the report clearly indicates that there were hieroglyphic type writing written on the lower portion wrapped around the outer circumference. Uh, next one, Wright Field, Dayton, Ohio. It had not become Wright-Patterson Air Force Base until October 1947. So it was still Wright Field, Dayton, Ohio. This is a private records management. And this is page 59 from Clark McClellan's book, Space the Final Frontier. So this will be just one case where we divert from Leonard here. But this is the cover of the book. And it, it basically has an interview with the gentleman who was at the location at the right place at the right time. He was delivering a letter to one of these military brass at Wright Field, Dayton, Ohio. He had a friend who was an MP, and this friend led him into the hangar at Wright Field. And in, in the kind of the back section of this hangar was this 15-foot diameter dish-shaped craft, seven feet tall. It had a straight or flat section wrapped around the outer circumference that had these rectangular transparent windows. No rivets, no seams, no weld marks, no socket head cap screws, no Zeus fasteners. Uh, this thing was highly polished aluminum chrome reflective. It looked like it was done on a 3D printer. It looked like it was built on the atomic level, stacking up atoms. And this came in from a railroad flat car from Arkansas and made it all the way to Wright Field, Dayton, Ohio. So here's my uh, cleaned up AutoCAD drawing here. If you look at this detail view on the upper right, I've peeled back the skin that shows you this three foot diameter central column that starts at the bottom of the craft and then goes all the way up to the top. Uh, and then if you look closely here, you can see this red dot on the front view on one of these windows. And this is the attempted point of entry where they were using a diamond tip drill bit to desperately try to breach the hull of this craft. This is something that pops up at least three other times within these cases. So this is something that's not uncommon. They are like trying desperately to get into these craft. Now here's my friend, Joseph Wraith. This is his full color rendering. Gives you an idea here. Up at the upper right hand corner, you can see this peel back view showing the interior of this three foot diameter central column. Now there were, there were no seats in this thing. There were no display panels. It was antiseptically sterile within the interior of the craft itself. Uh, this was my first pass illustration, just to give you an idea what the exterior would look like. And then this is Rudy's drawing of what this craft actually looks like. So if you look over to the right of the craft, there was a tarp that was folded up. Uh, near the foreground of the craft, there was a toolbox, there was an electric drill with a diamond tip drill bit, and then you've got the MP here. So this is very close per the actual eyewitness sketch. So. If you take everything that we've got from the report from the book of Clark McClellan, and then you take the original sketch, and then you bring in Ruby's drawing here, and we go to a full color rendering, this is what we came up with just to illustrate what this may have looked like if we were actually there back in 1946. And, you know, this thing came in by this railroad flat car and was dropped off here at Wright Field, Dayton, Ohio. All right, next one. This is uh, same place little bit of a different time, probably plus or minus within one or two months of the previous case we just talked about. This is UFO crash retrievals, page 242, page 243. So if you get the book, you can follow along with the page and just go through this case with a very fine tooth comb. Now, this was uh, 1946. The primary eyewitness at the time was a six-year-old boy named Tex Martin. And I believe it was this hangar complex, hangar number four. I don't know for sure, but I'm thinking it was probably 
this particular hangar complex. Now, his dad was a contractor at the base at the time, and there was a connecting cafeteria to the main hangar facility. And there was a janitor who wanted to buy a soda pop for this young six-year-old boy. And he asked his father if it was, it would, it was okay. He said, yes, it's okay. So this janitor buys this young six-year-old boy a soda pop, hands it to him concurrently as he's handing this soda pop to the six-year-old boy the door opens up into the hangar and this little boy looks inside i'm going to give you a rough sketch of what this looks like here so now he's looking inside the hangar door this is our first pass rough sketch of what this actually looks like and let's go to the rendering here here's the rough sketch first pass if you look at the background of the hangar you can see him peeking into the hangar facility and what he saw were two 18-wheeler tractor trailer low boy trucks. Each had debris that was covered by a tarp. There was a dish-shaped craft that had tripod landing gear legs. It had a dome on top. There were at least three ET bodies that were lying on the floor that had kind of like covers covering their bodies. So let's take this very rough pencil sketch. Let's do a refined drawing. And now you can see this whole scene come into view here. This craft was about 20 feet in diameter. It had two concentric rings wrapped around the outer circumference. You can see the uh, tripod landing gear. We've got the two tractor trailers with the uh, tarp debris on top. We've got the young boy looking into the hangar, peeking in in the background. And then in the foreground to the left, you've got the three ET bodies on these gurney stretchers. So let's take everything from Stringfield's report, which was basically discussed by this six-year-old boy who much later came forward after he heard, he heard a radio program about crash retrievals and it finally dawned on him decades later what he actually saw. Let's go to the full color rendering and this is what my good friend Joel Payne came up with just to give people an idea of what this thing looked like. So you can see him in the background and this thing was kind of an off-white color it was not a silver metallic. It had this milky white appearance. You've got the three ET bodies in the foreground and then the two tractor trailers. So this is 1946, uh, right field, Dayton, Ohio. Next one, Papagos Indian Reservation. This is west of Globe, Arizona, January 1947. So we're already three in and we're not even at Roswell yet. We're already three in here. This is north of Superstition Mountains. Primary source served in the U.S. Navy during World War II. This is page 93 of the book, case A-10. And in this particular case, we had two military personnel going down this unimproved area near the Superstition Mountains, and they're stopped by two MPs with carbides, telling them, hey, you're not supposed to be here. Get out of here immediately. Well, while they're being questioned, they look off to the left, another 100 feet forward off to the left, and they see a... 30-foot diameter dish-shaped craft, came in at about a 40-degree angle, had a dome on top, had two concentric rings, and then there were these indented sections that looked like windows but weren't windows wrapped around the outer circumference of the craft. And they're seeing all this. It's described in the book in, in kind of good detail. So let's uh, go to the full-color rendering, and this is what we came up with. If we were actually there in 1947, it would have looked something similar to this. So you can see kind of the sediment is piled up near the beginning part of the dome of the craft. If you look closely, you can see these indented sections wrapped around the outer circumference of the uh, dish-shaped craft itself. All right, let's continue here. White Sands Missile Range, July 4th, 1947. So we're finally at the timeline of Roswell here, and you can see the perimeter of White Sands Missile Range. And this is the Technical Sergeant, U.S. Army Air Force uh, Crash Retrievals, page 196. So that's where the information came from. And this is the refined drawing of this case. When it came down, it was 150 feet in diameter. Um, it was very well lit up. They had light alls, they had spotlights, they had searchlights on this thing. They had people with Geiger counters walking around this, taking analysis tests of this thing, looking if it was hot for radiation. They had pictures of uh, people with still cameras taking photographs. 
They had other people that had these motion picture film reels. And so this thing was very well documented. And this is all at night, but it was excruciatingly well lit. So I want to go to the full color rendering just to give everyone an idea of what this thing actually looked like. So here is the, this is at night. It's all lit up. Um, so somewhere out there, they've got the motion picture film reel of this. They've got the still photographer of this. Um, how did they move this thing if it's 150 feet in diameter? Well, they have been able to figure out a way to access these craft so that they divide into equal pie segments. Now, I don't know if that's the case with this one, but in other cases like Aztec and also other cases, um, these things break apart in pie segments. So I think that's an interesting way that they ship these things out of here. Uh, next one, 1947. So we're still within this Roswell timeline and we're already six in here. Seen at a warehouse of all places at Berkeley University, Albert Bruce Collins, now deceased. Uh, he's a metallurgical engineer. He's the source for this information. It comes from page 197. So You've got this uh, engineer at the right place at the right time when this 18-wheeler tractor trailer low boy truck backs into the facility. Now I'm gonna go to the drawing here and this is what this gentleman sees. It's an egg-shaped craft, 30 feet across, 15 feet tall. It had a hole breach on the side of it. It looked like a cracked egg. There was a three foot diameter egg yolk in the center. In the report, which is about two pages in length, this engineer said that there was a composite panel near the forward section of the craft. Uh, there was another composite panel that wrapped around the outer circumference of this internal yoke that was about three feet in diameter. There was what looked like two flat bands that wrapped around the outer portion of the craft itself. And then there was a hole breach where it appears that there was an implosion with the shrapnel and rough section popped out of the bottom right section of the craft itself. And this is what this guy is, is looking at. I mean, it must have been incredible. I asked the question, is this the entire craft or is this the propulsion system of something that's much larger? That's my question here. Let's go to the full color rendering. Now you see this thing and come into view. I mean, it, it literally looked like a cracked egg with a yolk inside and then the shrapnel coming out of this whole breach uh, back in 1947 at Berkeley University. Next one, Carrot Patch, July, August, 1947. So, you know, we're still within this Roswell timeline here. This was seen by two 19-year-old workers. It had came down the night before and the foreman alerted these two 19-year-old workers. And this came from Leonard Stringfield's 65 three ring uh, binder dictation notes. This is the sketch that came with the report. A Little bit of a small craft, nine feet in diameter, four feet tall. Um, it had these double row of indented, what you would call window sections, but again, I don't think they were windows. That's what this thing actually looked like. And here we've got the actual map X marks the spot. So if you look off to the left, you've got Highway 1, you've got 101, you've got uh, Gonzales and Soledad here. This is the location of where this thing came down. Now, when the two boys saw this thing, one of them had enough guts to walk up to it, he kicked the side of it with his boot. So he made physical contact with this craft. Here is my first pass AutoCAD drawing, just to give you an idea of what this thing looked like based on the original sketch. So again, this is July, August, 1947, nine feet in diameter, four feet tall, had kind of a flat section up on top. This was my first pass, very rough, almost childlike illustration of what this thing may look like very early rendering. And then I wanna to go to Rudy's drawing that really kind of makes this thing come alive here. And within five minutes of these two young boys who were the primary eyewitnesses, within five minutes of them arriving, there was a military convoy that told them to vacate the area immediately. And they watched them load this craft onto an 18 wheeler six by six troop transport and then get this thing out of here. Um, I mean, this was like a full-fledged military operation. They retrieved the craft, got it out of the area here. And then this is Joel's drawing of what this thing may look like. This is, I mean, I, I don't think we can do much better than this. Uh, this is very close per the eyewitness testimony, per the witness sketch of what this thing looks like. And you can see these indented sections 
wrapped around the outer circumference of the craft itself. And you know, as we go through these cases, as I mentioned before, the body count goes up, the craft count goes up, and it just keeps adding up from here. All right, next one. This is sometime prior to 1951. I'm thinking 1948 timeline, so we're still within our chronological timeline here. This had to do with a C-119 flying boxcar, Sierra Madre Valley, Mexico. And this was a engineer who was basically involved in highway construction. This is page 32 of the book. And this has to do with about a nine foot diameter dish shaped craft. Two bodies were recovered. Now, how do I know that this was a nine foot diameter craft? Because the interior wall dimension of the C-119 flying boxcar is nine feet, 10 inches. So we have to allow five inches on either side. So that's where we came up with the dimension of nine feet. It can't be any bigger than nine feet in order for it to fit in here. So he is asked by the United States military to aid in this retrieval operation. So here you've got the C-119 flying boxcar. You've got the F cargo bay doors open up and they're with a hoist and uh, lanyard mechanism. They're kind of dragging this craft into the aft cargo bay of the C-119 flying boxcar. So let's go to the full color rendering by Joseph Wraith. And in the foreground, you can see these charred bodies. I mean, it was a gruesome sight. The primary eyewitness said that when he walked up to the bodies and he touched their faces, their burnt skin came off on his fingers. So this was a gruesome sight. Uh, let's go a little bit more of a detailed view. Let's zoom in and let's see if we can get a, a more of a detailed view of the craft now being basically brought into the aft cargo bay of the C-119. <clears throat> Interesting case. Um, you know, it's it really boils down to the credibility of these military witnesses. And you might be able to discount two, three, four, maybe. But when you have 119 credible military witnesses telling us that these retrieval operations are historically authentic, I think we should pay attention and listen to what they had to say here. Next one, Sunnyvale, California, Hangar 1. Uh, this hangar still exists to this day. I've actually been in this hangar. This is Naval Air Station 1950. The primary source was a radar operator. This is case B5 of the book, page 57. Now, this radar operator, he kind of went through a double doorway. He got access to the interior of this massive hangar. This hangar is so large that it has its own weather inside. That's how big this hangar is. So he walks through these double doors. He looks inside this hangar and he sees this massive 100 foot diameter dish shaped craft that had a dome on top. There was what looked like porthole windows wrapped around the outer circumference of the lower portion of the dome. He was challenged by a military police officer, told him to get out of here immediately. And I'm just going to go back one slide and talk about what he said here. This was his quote. It was certainly no aircraft of ours coming from this radar operator. So interesting case. You know, these are the caliber of witnesses that is talked about within this book here. Now, next one. This is a classified materials library at an unknown U.S. Air Force base. And this is a former military officer, page 212, page 213. So he's at this library and it's kind of a break time. So he had the correct security clearance to access this facility. He pulled up one of these file drawers and he was looking through these files and he saw a manila folder that had crash retrievals on it. He pulls these files out and there was an eight by 10 glossy black and white photograph of a UFO retrieval operation. And there was a report, uh, there was mention of a pathology uh, biological doctor report. So we believe that there was an autopsy, bodies were involved may not necessarily have been associated with this case, but there was talk of bodies. So let's go to a drawing that would illustrate this case. So here we are at this case. This was Farmington, New Mexico, sometime prior to 1950. So a dish-shaped craft, about 36 feet in diameter, has a small dome on top with porthole windows. And within this report, it talks about one of the windows had a small pencil size hole that they could fit a pencil through. This is very interesting because there's other cases that also have this very small pencil hole as well. Uh, key points in this case, I'm gonna start up here. Number one, 
military officer had the correct security clearance, which gave him access to a classified materials library. Number two, reports seen by witness made reference to crashes, more than one, and that bodies were recovered. Number three, in addition, diamond tip drill bits and acetylene torches were used to gain access to the interior. Reference two other cases that we'll talk about if we have time here. Number four, eventually, technicians were able to gain access to the interior of the craft by way of a small entry hatch. The report said, referring to the door, that it was almost as if the material of the craft liquefied and then solidified again. So that's how fully integrated these seams are. It's almost this liquid metal that we hear about in Terminator 2. You know, you see the seams and then yeah. it solidifies, liquefies, and then it's almost like it's not even there. That's how fully integrated these seams are on this craft here. Now, no discussion about Farmington, New Mexico would be complete unless we talk about the Farmington Armada. This is Albuquerque Journal, March 18, 1950. Hundreds at Farmington report large force of flying saucers. So there were like 500 dish shaped craft making these right angle turns, back, backing up. There was one that was the quote unquote leader. I mean, there were, there were dozens of eyewitnesses that saw this in March of 1950. This is an absolute watershed event. But what I thought was interesting is somewhat similar timeline here, early 1950s, specifically 1952 timeframe, there are dozens and dozens of these newspaper clippings. This is Cincinnati Inquirer, July 29th, 1952. Shoot saucers down, jet pilots so ordered in 24 hour alert. There was a call that went out by the US Air Force to our fighter pilots to shoot these things down in the early 1950s. I mean, there was a standing order for this. Uh, I got a couple other clippings here. Jets keeping 24-hour alert for saucers. Pilots ordered to down objects if they don't land. On the saucer trail, pilots told shoot them down. Jets on 24-hour alert to shoot down saucers. So here's the aircraft that they were being used to try to intercept and shoot these things down. It's the F-94 Starfire. And if you go to the Pima Air and Space Museum in Tucson, Arizona, you can see one of these parked out there in the uh, desert with all the other aircraft on display. And it's got a series of rockets in the nose. So if you go to the Air Force Museum in Dayton, Ohio, they have these rocket flaps in the deployed position where they're peeled back, getting ready to shoot. You can see here off to the left, it's concealed off to the right. The flaps are open and it's ready to fire. So it's kind of a historical aircraft because these are the ones they use to shoot these saucers down. So this is kind of Rudy's drawing of what an attempted intercept might look like, but these are what these pilots are telling us. And so that's why I wanna to go to this slide. And this is very interesting. This is a letter that Mildred Bissell wrote to Leonard Stringfield, October 2nd, 1979. And I think it's important that we consider this. This is what this lady wrote to Leonard here. I heard you speak at the MUFON Symposium in Dayton last year, and I'm interested in your research on retrievals of the third kind. I gave a talk at a local library last week, and in the discussion period following, a fellow told me that when he was a gunner in the Air Force, he had emptied his guns on a UFO and had taken pictures with his gun camera that clearly showed the shells exploding against the side of the craft. He said the camera was taken off the wing of his plane when it landed and the pictures developed. At 2 a.m., a couple of military policemen came and got him out of bed and took him to the base auditorium. They ran the 17 seconds of movie of the UFO over and over and questioned him and two other crew members until 10 a.m. He was warned never to tell anyone what had happened. He said he had a wife and a family, a good job and a lot to lose. He seemed afraid of the CIA and wouldn't even give me his name. So here's just one example of gun camera footage. Now, if you go back to World War II, the Korean War, Vietnam, Desert Storm, all of these wars, they all employed gun camera footage. So, you know, you could take this thing back to World War II. I am certain that there are warehouses, there are vaults full of this gun camera footage. None of this has ever been seen. Old footage, new footage, uh, motion picture film reel. I mean, it is there, they've got the access. But the problem is 
senators and congressmen without the appropriate security clearances, uh, they, they don't have access to this material and they don't have a need to know about this. And so that's one reason why all this has been kept under wraps for all these years. Next one, Pentagon 1952. This is an office worker, page 152, case one. Now, in this particular case, this office worker, we believe she went through these off limit double doors at the lower vault at the Pentagon. And so she's going through this double door. She goes into this room. Um, it's dark, it's dingy. Um, it's a very poorly lit room. There's some cardboard boxes in there. She kind of does a, a turn and what does she see right in front of her? She, see a, she sees a pickled alien in a glass jar and she is absolutely shocked by what she's seeing here. Within five seconds, there's a military police officer that grabs her arm, pulls her out of here. Uh, she had to sign agreements not to talk about this. Uh, Leonard got to her years later, and she basically said, I don't want to talk about this. You know, I'm done with this. I don't want anything to do with this. But she did see this. It was there. It may still be there today, somewhere in a lower vault at the Pentagon. Uh, this is my drawing by uh, Joseph Ray, just to give you an idea of what this may have looked like back in 1952. Now, Camp Polk, Louisiana, December 1953. The source is a private in the Army. This is case A1, page 80. This is the drawing that Rudy came up with that gives you an idea of what this thing looked like. Similar to that 47 egg thing. Uh, this was about 30 feet across. It looked like an egg. It had a fin wrapped around the outer portion of the craft itself. There were three ET bodies that had to be helped by medical personnel. There was another ET body that was being carried off in a stretcher in this gurney. They were trying to establish communication between the three and the one that was being carried off. Now, these beings were about three and a half feet tall. They had oversized heads, oversized eyes, slit for a mouth, minute nose. They were wearing a one-piece tight-fitting flight suit and they had helmets on, they had what looked like mittens on, and then they had um, what I thought was very interesting, no knee joints. They only had joints on their um, hips. So when they were walking, they had this stair staggered walking as they were walking by. They had to be helped by these medical personnel. Very bizarre uh, that they had no knee, but that's what's talked about within this report. So let's go to Joseph's drawing here, his full color rendering. I'm going to give him credit. The whole vicinity, the localized area where this thing came down, it was hot to the touch. There was this red soil that was scorched. Uh, you can kind of see the hatchways opened up. And let's do a zoom in, get a little bit of a closer view here. Now you can see these beings walking out of this entryway hatch. One piece tight fitting flight suits, no knee joint mittens they were wearing and this transparent helmet. Uh, let's go to the view here now showing you their comrade being carried off into the back end of the ambulance truck. And let's do one more view. Let's zoom a little bit closer now. And now we can see this uh, comrade being carried off into the ambulance truck. And so again, this is what these military witnesses are telling us here. Right, Patterson Air Force Base. 1953, Army Reserves Warrant Officer. We actually have his name. Page 15, abstract number eight. And this is uh, within the book. Very good case. I really love this case. So I believe, again, this is hangar number four. It could be Bay E, which I've got the uh, little bit of an arrow here. Let's do a front view. I've actually been inside this hangar as well. But this warrant officer is at the right place at the right time. It's around 9 p.m. when a four engine cargo DC-7 taxis up onto the tarmac. I'm gonna to go to the next slide here. So you've got the four engine DC-7 and just picture this taking place inside the hangar. So this DC-7 taxis up onto the, to the tarmac, the hangar doors open up. This DC-7 taxis inside, immediately the hangar doors close. And then there's a port F cargo bay that opens up and there's a forklift that starts offloading these pallets. And on one of these pallets, there were three wooden crates with their tops pulled off. He's only a couple feet away. 
let's go to the next slide. So he looks down and inside these wooden crates and he sees three ET bodies, three and a half to four feet tall, oversized head, oversized eye, slit for a mouth, all wearing a one piece tight fitting flight suit. One was female. He also said that they were being suspended off the bottom of the crates to protect their bodies from the dry ice freezer burn below. And they had this white mesh netting that was suspending them off the uh, bottom of the crates. And so he's looking at all this. Let's go to Joseph's full color rendering to give us an idea of what this may have looked like. He was also told about the debris that was recovered from the crash site. And so that's what you see in the background with all these crates. And you can kind of see the steam coming off from this uh, dry ice below at the bottom of the crates here. Now let's do a top view looking down just to give an idea of what this may look like. Uh, and again, I want to repeat that one was female. He said one had breasts. So it was his assumption that one of these beings was female. Next one. Dutton, Montana, 1953, Cecil Tenney is the witness. He's a civilian. Abstract number 11, page 16. So this primary source is driving down the road. He licks up. He sees this massive 300-foot-long cigar-shaped craft tipped up at a 45-degree angle. It's belching out fire and smoke. It, it's trying to keep itself up. It's having a hard time. The oncoming traffic that he notices he looks at their tailpipes, and I'm going to go to the next drawing here. The tailpipes of the oncoming traffic, their tailpipes were caught on fire. So there was some type of a gas, gaseous type thing going on that caused the tailpipes of the oncoming traffic to catch on fire. Now, a little bit later on, this primary eyewitness, he pulls into this restaurant and he files a report a little bit earlier, a police officer also files a report, and this restaurant owner basically tells on this primary eyewitness to, uh, to the police officer. He actually made contact with him. That night, the primary eyewitness got a call from the base commander, and this is later Melbs from Air Force Base, and this base commander said, I want to see it. So he shows up the next day, uh, he is basically interrogated. He's told to sign these non-disclosure agreements. You know, he, he really get, he got a grilling over this. While he's leaving this Air Force base, he sees these two military police with these big, thick sacks over their shoulder. One of these guys tripped, and this sack fell off the shoulder of one of these MPs. And he said that the lumps that were associated with the interior of this knapsack reminded him of human body parts. So I don't know if it was an ET retrieval or man-made retrieval, but he said it looked like human body parts within this uh, potato sack, you could call it. Now, this is not an isolated incident because I pulled up this report. This is Argentina, December 7th, 1954, where a similar cigar-shaped craft was tipped up at about a 30-degree angle. It was spewing belching smoke off the back end of it. At least three saucer-shaped craft came out of an iris that opened up. One went forward, one went back, one went vertically down. And so this is just another case where these cigar-shaped craft are being seen. Um, it's not completely unprecedented with this smoke coming out of the back of the craft. And here's kind of a uh, first pass illustration just to give people an idea of what that may actually look like. Next one, Walker Air Force Base, New Mexico, April 12, 1954. Primary source served in the Air Force from 1954 to 1955. This is page 82 in the book. I want to point out that Walker Air Force Base used to be Roswell Army Airfields. We're talking about the same base here, but this is 1954. Primary source was told to board an H-19 helicopter. This is at night. So the helicopter takes off. They head northbound. They make a left-hand turn. Now they're heading toward Corona, which is the spot of the original crash retrieval in 1947. So they arrive at night and they had a spotlight on the bottom of this H-19 helicopter that was illuminating the scene here. So he opens up the door, takes a still photography camera, and he's taking photographs of this scene. I mean, he can't believe what he's seeing. 
there were multicolored lights that were still rotating around the outer circumference of the craft itself. This was about 50 feet in diameter, came in at a 40 degree angle, uh, had a dome on top. There was a entry way hatch that was exposed. There were four bodies retrieved, and then they found another two bodies in the interior for a grand total of six. Now, when the helicopter landed, and I'm going to go to the next slide here, as soon as the helicopter landed and the primary eyewitness got out of this helicopter, he said the, the entire area of this localized vicinity of where this thing came down smelled like automobile battery acid. That's the first thing he mentioned. Now, later on, they found the other two bodies. By this time, the retrieval operation was completely in full swing at this point. There were jeeps coming up. They had a convoy of militaries coming up. There were six by six troop transports coming up. Uh, these multicolored lights, they were still going around the outer circumference of the craft itself. So this is 1954, New Mexico. Uh, the other Roswell, 1955. This is across the Texas-Mexican border. This is spring 1955, Del Rio, uh, south of Del Rio, Texas. And the sources are Ruben and Noe that wrote this book. So that's the source of this material. Uh, so I wanna set this up. There were at least two B-47s that were heading westbound over South Texas. They were being escorted by a couple of uh, F-86 Sabre jets. And all of a sudden, a dish-shaped craft comes screaming by their flight path. One of these F-86 Sabre jets peels away. He asked for permission. He was given permission. I'm going to go back one slide. And he's following this craft as it augers in. It leaves a debris trail just south of the Rio Grande River. So he does a low pass over the scene, makes a left-hand turn. He lands at Carswell Air Force Base, gets out of the F-86. He drives to Corsica gets in a two-seat tail dragger Aranka with his friend, and they fly back to the crash site before darkness. It's st starting to get a little bit cold here, but it was still light out. So I'm going to go forward here. And what he sees when he lands is this scene right here. So this thing was 25 feet in diameter, five feet tall. The upper dome had popped off. Here you see his Aranka in the foreground to the right. There was a debris trail. Now by this time, it was starting to get a little bit cold. And the primary eyewitness stated that these Mexican soldiers were going into the back of this troop transport that you see off to the left here. They were taking out blankets and they were putting these blankets on this warm debris. And then once it was warm, they were putting the blankets on their bodies just to warm their bodies up. Now, he also mentioned that there was a hull breach on the side of the craft. He looked inside and there were four badly dismembered and burnt bodies. This was not a pleasant scene here. Let's go to the full color rendering. I'm gonna zoom in here, give you an idea of what this thing looks like inside the craft itself. Uh, the primary eyewitness, Air Force pilot, Robert Willingham said, quote, the arms look like broomsticks. That's what these ET bodies look like, arms that had looked like broomsticks. Here is Joel's full color rendering. Again, the Mexican military got there before the Americans did. Uh, you can see the debris trail, you see the dome in the background, and then the six by six troop transport. So let's zoom in here and get kind of a get of a, a bit of a uh, magnified view of this hull breach on the side of the craft with these four ET bodies that were in very sad shape uh, back in spring 1955. Now, next one, Wright Patterson Air Force Base, Mrs. G. This is the source, this is a very good case. She worked in the Foreign Materials Division at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. This is uh, abstract 12, page 17. So if anyone who wants to follow along on the book, that's where this came, for, came from here. So picture the closing scene of Indiana Jones, Raiders of the Lost Ark. You've got this massive military warehouse. You've got these crates stacked up. You've got all these things stacked up and her job within this warehouse, and I'm gonna go one more forward here. It could be building 258, I know, don't know for sure, but something that looked like this. Her job was to catalog a thousand components that came into the base from a UFO crash retrieval. We're talking about a thousand components here. 
And the way they had this thing set up, and I'm going to go to the next slide here, this is Rudy's drawing, is the debris would come in, and then they had one station where a gentleman would take a photograph of this debris. The next station, there was a gentleman who bagged it and tagged it, and then it was moved to over to Mrs. G that you see here in the lower right-hand corner. She cataloged it. We're talking about a thousand components here. So they started putting all these components on the shelving. And then while she's typing up the labels of all this and cataloging everything, there was a rollable mobile gurney, mobile dolly that went by that had two ET bodies that were preserved in this formaldehyde chemical preservation fluid. And she saw that as well. So she, not only did she see the debris, but she saw two bodies as well. Now, researchers got to him, to her six months before she did, and this is, uh, died, and this is the exact quote that she mentioned. This is like six months before she died. Quote, Uncle Sam can't do anything to me once I'm in my grave. Six months later, she passed away. So we got her testimony literally within months of her passing. Now here's Joel's full color rendering of what this may have looked like in this warehouse. And you can see they're populating all this shelving with this debris, crash debris. There may be some bodies in jars, but something similar to this. Kind of in the background forward uh, middle section, you can see one of these gentlemen taking the photograph of the debris, and then they'd eventually make it to her uh, as the cataloging process. But So somewhere out there in a government warehouse, could still be at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base to this day, there are a thousand components that came in from a crash retrieval. So we can't hear this claim that we don't have any evidence here. Okay, next one. Retired Air Force pilot, late 1950s. This was an interview conducted by Ed Kamarak Jr. Uh, this is a five to six minute film clip. And what this film clip depicted was a, about a 60 foot diameter dish shaped craft. It had a 10 foot gash on the side of it. Within this movie film clip, they showed the interior of the craft. And so that's what you see on the upper right hand corner, a detailed and large view with these butts, buttons and switches and dials, maybe display panels. It also showed a view of the propulsion system that may have been the associated with an implosion. And the propulsion system was basically ejected from the interior of the craft itself. Three bodies recovered about five feet tall they were sitting off to the right lower portion of the craft itself. Here's a detailed drawing that shows you what the propulsion system may look like and this lower display screen here. Uh, we'll do a couple more here. Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, 1962. This is the 354th Tactical Air Command fighter wing. They were basically running down their morning jog. Uh, they were going through this row of hangars. One of these hangar doors was opened up they looked inside and they see this 15 foot diameter dish shaped craft that looked like two track and field discs put together. It was propped up the off the hangar floor by two engine test stands. They had this thing roped off. There were MPs with carbides guarding this. And this is page 88, case A6. And these pilots were challenged about this. And I want to go to the next slide here. And this is the exact quote from this Air Force pilot. This is what he said. The guard challenged by saying, I don't think you're supposed to be here, sir. I replied to the affirmative and we turned about face and departed mumbling to ourselves that the good old US had developed or had all along flying saucers in service. So I, I really believe this is an authentic case. Why would these five fighter pilots, pilots be lying? I mean, th this rings true to me. I believe we can trust our... Uh, our pilots here. So I think we've got time for one more here. This is December 1963, Cherry Point, North Carolina. This is a US Marine. We do have his, his uh, name, page 152, case A2. So this Marine, and I'm gonna go to the next slide here, and this shows you the location of Cherry Point, North Carolina Marine Base here. This is north of Havelock. He's told to board a plane with blacked out windows. They fly three hours by plane to a location that he wasn't briefed about. And when they get there, they go to this facility, they open up these hangar doors and he sees a 40 foot 
diameter dish shaped craft, 15 feet tall. It has this fat hamburger look to it. It's highly polished aluminum reflective. It has nine elliptically shaped opaque windows wrapped around the outer circumference of the craft itself. It has these very small outlines of seams that you could not put a razor blade in there. And you can see here these red dots indicate the attempted point of entry with a diamond tip drill bit. So this thing had basically no fasteners. There were no weld seams. There were no socket head cap screws. I'm going to go to the next drawing here. This is Joseph's full color rendering. And you can see these uh, opaque windows wrapped around the outer circumference. I mean, this thing was perfectly built like it was printed on a 3D printer here. Uh, I want to give credit to Joseph Wraith, who did the full color rendering here. Now, there were three ways they tried to enter the craft. Number one, diamond tip drill bits. That failed. Number two, acetylene torch. That failed. Number three, yes, they did have lasers in 1963, December 1963. That failed as well. So there were three attempts to get in. All three failed. This is the sketch by the U.S. Marine. This is not my sketch. This is his original sketch. Mm -hmm. I'm going to break this down. Upper left and upper right hand corner, very well lit, excruciatingly well lit. If you look at the bottom here, you can see that they had this thing propped off the hangar floor by scaffolding. You could walk under this thing. There was an entryway point from the left and also to the right. This thing was propped up off the floor with a scaffolding and they built a catwalk where you could walk around this thing. If you look on the bottom of the craft, you can see these pads that were supporting the craft on the scaffolding. You see the opaque windows, and on one of the windows you have a dot, that's the attempted point of entry. And then if you look at the seams on the hatchway at the lower right-hand portion of the craft itself, it also has these dots where they were trying to get inside as well. This is the slightly more refined drawing by Michael Johnstone who interviewed the Marine back in, uh, 1963, uh, back in 1986. I'm going to go to my drawing that gives you a little bit of a detailed view of this ledge that this Marine could feel with his thumb. So there was a one inch lip that was from the outer exterior of the craft itself that also made up the outer exterior of the opaque windows. There was this little lip that you could feel with your thumb. Also want to mention Below this craft, taped off on the hangar floor, was a white circle. His job was to shoot to kill anyone who would breach that circle because he was guarding this craft for a period of two weeks. Uh, this is Joseph's full color rendering of what this may actually look like. So what I want to do now is I'm going to walk through this facility. And this is Jose Sanchez's uh, interesting drawing of the diamond tip drill bit disintegrating as they're trying to breach the hull of this craft, which they didn't do. Here was the first color rendering by John McNeil. You can see the scaffolding. You've got the catwalk. Uh, they did bring in two 18-wheeler tractor trailer low boy trucks. They were using a laser to get in. When they moved the laser away, it was strictly warm to the touch. Other than that, there was no effect on the exterior of the craft itself. So let's pretend that we are a fly penetrating this chain link fence and getting access covertly without anyone knowing to the interior of this facility here. Okay, so let's go through the chain link fence. We made it through. Let's fly a little bit closer into the scene here. Uh, now we're starting to see this whole thing in view. You've got the white circle taped off on the floor. You've got this 40 foot hamburger shaped craft on the scaffolding. You can definitely see the catwalk. You've got military guards. You've got the white lab coat technicians. Let's zoom in a little bit closer. He did mention within the report that there was these black suitors. So there were CIA types there. Uh, a little bit closer view. Now you see the one inch lip on these opaque windows. The little seam on the entryway hatch is coming into view. This is a 45 degree look down angle of the entire scene. Again, this thing is 40 feet in diameter and it's got this polished aluminum exterior. Off to the left, you see these CIA types that are kind of like talking to these military guards. This is about a 30 degree angle look down, uh, just to give a little bit better idea. Uh, again, this whole place was excruciatingly well lit. 
So there were no shadows. I mean, this thing was well lit. Now, on the last day he was there, because his job was to frisk anyone who came in and guard this facility for two weeks, he said he saw this thing being lifted off the scaffolding, put on a cradle device, and then they were building this, you could call it um, a framework around the craft itself, and they were draping tarps over this framework. So here you see it's about 50% tarped up, getting ready to be shipped up to the next location. Now we're fully tarped. You can see this cradle device with the pads supporting the craft itself. And now we're absolutely ready to move it to the next location. Here it is being rolled out. And now we're entering the uh, back part of the facility where the hangar doors are opened up, getting ready to ship it out. We're outside the facility now and we're getting ready to move it to the next location. So the two ways that they keep these under wraps is number one, they compartmentalize this information. Number two, they move each asset from one place to the other. So early on in the 40s, 50s, 60s, these things may have stayed at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, but later on, they might have moved to another facility. So that's one way they keep secrets here. This is Ruby's drawing that shows you what this retrieval operation may have looked like in its initial stages here. Uh, I wanna talk about this laser incident. When they were shining this laser on the side of the craft, it reflected off, bounced off the craft, and then damaged the ceiling tile. That's what you see in this illustration. It damaged the ceiling tile. So there was an effect associated with the laser in this incident here. Here's the drawing, original drawing, that illustrates this incident that takes place. So in the foreground, you've got this laser, you've got the reflection, and then off to the upper right, X marks the spot where it damaged the ceiling tile. A similar event with a laser takes place in this poor B movie, Hangar 18, that many of you have seen. Uh, there is a, it shows similar things. So is Hollywood a belated designer leak? Because in this movie, they have white lab coat technicians, they have scaffolding, they have an incident with a laser, almost identical to what this Marine had talked about that he was a part of back in 1963. He also mentioned that there were color-coded badges with these white lab coat technicians. So if you had a green badge, you could go here. If you had a yellow badge, you could go here, but you couldn't go to an off-limits part of this facility. If you had a red badge, you had access to this entire facility here. Now, there was one point where this military person who was a Marine at the time, December 1963, he, he took a Minox camera, he snuck it in, and he took a photograph of this particular craft. Here's his direct quote. Someday I will tell this story, and by God, people are going to believe me. That photograph was lost in a flood back in 1983. So I decided, you know what? Let's do a replica. Let's see if we can do a replica of what that thing actually may have looked like. This is the illustration that Joseph came up with of a Minox camera photograph. You know, it'd be decades old by now, so it would be tinted, it would be brown, it might be stained, it would be off-white, uh, a little bit out of color, a little bit grainy, but something similar to this, if we could actually see this photograph today. We were so close of getting the evidence, but it's always two steps ahead of us. Talk about this real quick. Uh, while he was there, this Marine said that there was an incident with a U.S. Secretary of the Navy back in December 1963, and I tracked it down to this gentleman. I, I don't know for sure, but I believe it was this gentleman. So Paul Nitz might have had a partial need to know, but not a full need to know. He was Secretary of the Navy between 1963 to 1967. So the timeline checks out. Want to talk about Melvin McNichol. He was base commander Tinker Air Force Base in Oklahoma. This is his obituary, the Daily Oklahoma, July 11th, 1986. Ex-Tinker commander Melvin McNichol dies. He happened to be friends with Charlotte Mann, who's involved in the 1941 Cape Girardeau retrieval operation because she held the photograph of one of the bodies that was retrieved. These two good... Or they were good friends. They had a mutual interest in UFOs. And so Charlotte turned to Melvin McNichol 
asked her to give her a brief, get, ask him to give him a, a briefing on UFOs, the general turns to uh, Charlotte Mann and says, Charlotte, if you ever repeat what I'm about to tell you, I'll deny it and it could ruin my career. He proceeds to tell Charlotte three things. Number one, he personally saw a UFO that was located in the West that tracks with what the Marine had said. Number two, he walked around a UFO that was on a catwalk propped up by scaffolding. This is exactly what the Marine said. Number three, he said that bodies were recovered and one was still alive. The US Marine back in December, 1963, overheard water cooler talk by these white lab coat technicians talking about bodies being recovered and one was still alive. So when I heard that from Charlotte Mann, who gave a lecture at IUFOC, I knew I had a real case here. Now to kind of wrap things up, this is the statement by this US Marine. Could the public handle the truth regarding UFO disclosure? Quote, there's a certain amount of people who, if the thing was on display down the street, would still rather stay home and watch football. Mm -hmm. Statement by US Marine, August 22nd, 1986. So within this presentation, James, I, I just wanted to give a, a brief overview of some of these UFO crash retrieval cases. These are coming from credible military witnesses. And you know, within this presentation, I just wanted to bring these cases alive through drawings and illustrations to preserve an important part of our national history. Yeah, I think this this work is incredibly important and uh, it's it's pretty amazing it, where, the way it gives you a, a kind of almost like an inside look into the whole thing. Yeah, an inside look to the best of our ability. Yes, an inside look. That's correct. That's I, correct. I mean, it, for, for me watching it, it, it kind of gave me a view of like, different parts of of crash retrievals which i hadn't even considered the different stages and mm -hmm. everything that might be involved with it uh so you know uh, i appreciate that is, sure. is is that do you have is there more to that presentation or is oh that there's it? there's there's certainly there's more for the for the next ice age yeah there's there's more for the next ice age so there's plenty more cases to consider yep yeah do you do you already have that prepared in a, in a slideshow uh, yeah, I mean, it, it continues on there and, you know, maybe sometime down the line, we will do a part two if you want to, but, you know, this is just kind of a brief overview of the, the first group of cases here. You know, I've documented my sources. I provided the page number. I've provided the case number. People are more than happy to, you know, research and reference this on their own with the book. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, just, uh, do, do you happen to have the, the starfish prime case? I'm not familiar with that case. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm just curious because it's, 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 um, I think it's 1962 or 1963 high altitude nuclear detonation on the Pacific where, uh, you know, an alleged, you know, UFO came down in the water. Okay. And it's hmm. interesting. Yeah. Uh, was it retrieved? I believe so. You believe so is, do we have any pencil sketches from the original eyewitnesses? I don't know if there's pencil sketches. I mean, it, it's it, it's an obscure one, but I, I yeah. I mean, I have it on some good sources that it it's a really important case. Okay. You know, Tom well, DeLong. Yeah. yeah. There, there's a lot of cases out there that we don't know about. You yeah. Know, they, these are the oh. crown jewels. This is the varsity team. Yeah. They're not going to advertise this. This has to be d dug up. This has to be dug up for sure. Yeah. And uh, do, is, you know, further in the presentation, is there, do you have the Virginia Brazil case? No, I don't have that case. Okay. I don't have that case. Yeah. Cause that's it's a very know. good case though. I've heard about it. I'm somewhat familiar with that case, but yeah. Interesting case. And the yeah. beams are very interesting too. Right. Yeah. And uh, just, just one more note is the, the accessing the, the inside of the interior of the craft, right. Is uh, recently uh, Jim Lekatsky who was the program director on the DIA side for OSAP. Okay. Um, in his book, Initial Revelations with Colm Kelleher and George Knapp talked about where, you know, Jim Katsky was in a, in a, basically a Pentagon meeting okay. and there was a discussion and this was cleared by Dobster. So he could talk about it, that they had successfully gained access to the interior of one of these crafts. And it doesn't specify which one, but, interesting note you know well it, it's certainly in a lot of the cases within the Stringfield collection 
it appears that it's very difficult to get inside a number of these craft. And the only reason why I mention that is because, you know, they tried with the diamond tip drill bits and that failed. Then they tried with the acetylene torches and that failed. Then they tried with the um, laser and that failed. There is some indication uh, within the book talking about how the only ways that they could get in, and I've heard this in other cases too, is number one, they dip the entire craft into a vat of liquid nitrogen and they cool shock it. And that's how they get in. The other one, and this is referenced from Philip Corso, is when they apply a certain frequency to the skin of the craft, it becomes malleable. And that might be the only other way to get inside. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'd love to have you back on sometime. Sure. To go through, uh, continue from the presentation or, or what have you. Yeah. No but uh, 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 where where can people, where can everybody find your incredible work? Uh, I'm on Facebook for sure. I'm also on YouTube. Um, you can type in my name, Michael Shroud. It'll, it'll pop up. Uh, if you if you type in Blue Room Media, it'll it'll pop up too. But primarily, if you type in my name, my my YouTube channel, Michael Shrat, um, primary source uh, that that's where it is. That's where it is. On and uh, all my crash retrieval uh, lectures are on that YouTube channel. Yeah, and uh, I I I think you just made a Twitter, or I think it's I yeah, saw one Twitter over there. Too. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Tw I don't know if you're familiar, but UFO Twitter or Twitter X, whatever, you know, or UFO X, whatever you want to call it these days is really uh, active. Ah, uh -huh. okay. So, you know, I, I hope people should follow you there and hopefully you can get involved in sharing your presentations on there because I'm sure it'll circulate very well. Right. Um, do you have any parting words for the audience? Um, the only parting words I would offer up is that some of these cases are 50, 60 years old. I mean, and if you go back to Roswell, now we're way back in time. We've already talked about a, a, a number of cases uh, that are prior to Roswell. If you factor in um, Battle of Los Angeles, that was 1942. There was one craft recovered in the mountains, one craft recovered in the ocean. This is all before Roswell. And then if you take it even further back to 1941, at Cape Girardeau, uh craft was recovered and three bodies were recovered. Uh, there are so many craft talked about. The bodies are, are mentioned by the witnesses. The best we can do at this point is to track down and interview these surviving legacy crash retrieval witnesses. Get their testimony on tape before they die because oh. that could potentially lead us to their bosses which could lead us to the craft and bodies where they're storing this. And that's that's our final shot. That's yeah. the best angle that we can approach this from, really. Well, and that's exactly what James Fox did with his film Moment of Contact. Okay. Um, the, the 1996 Virginia Brazil case, because it's so, I mean, it's compared to everything else. It's so recent. Mm -hmm. Witnesses are still living. He got yeah. them on the record. And, you know, one of the really... Uh, interesting things about that case is that you know the brazilian uh, military was on it but they the brazilian military personnel reported that the u.s came in and basically took control of the operation they took the bodies and they took the craft okay you know so that's another interesting you know note and uh, you know, I've heard, and I, I don't know if this is true, but I've heard speculation that some of the whistleblowers that are currently mm, coming forward in different ways to the mm, intelligence uh, community, Inspector General and 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 Congress, uh, was somebody that was involved with that case. I don't. That's that's uh, hearsay, as far as I'm concerned. So far, I've only heard that from one person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But if that's true, that's a direct uh, connection to uh, you know living source that was involved in a in a crash retrieval operation. But so, in other words, the United States military came in, uh, secured the area, had everyone else stand down, and then stole the craft and the bodies, the living ET beings, out from the under under the nose of the Mexican. Well or the, the Brazilian, right? yeah, but it, no, I, th I think they kind Brazilian. of handed it over to us. They Maybe there's some kind over? of agreement. Mm, okay. You know, <laughs> we'll see if it was an agreement, right? 
I, I mean, yeah, right. I, I, I hear what you're saying, but that's the, I mean, that's not the only time I've heard the U S has come basically come in and, uh, you know, taken, uh, possession of what, where, whatever it is. And then again, I don't know, you know, it's, it's just an interesting note that comes up. Are there any detailed descriptions of the craft itself? What yes, it and that when, so during your presentation, you're talking about a cigar shape that's yeah. struggling to stay up in the air. Yeah. So this craft allegedly first, before it even crashed, witnesses saw it in the air smoking as if it was hit with like a, 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 a like a directed energy weapon. They didn't say that, but <laughs> and you All see right. a gash in the side. It's a cigar shaped craft. There's smoke coming out of it. It's struggling in the air. Okay. And uh shortly after that it went down. Um what's the what's the dimension of it? How long is it? Oh, I forget the dimensions, but it sounded it sounded pretty big. It sounded pretty long. Okay. They they may have said in the um in the film how how big it was. But uh, you know, an interesting note to that is um Dr. Roger Lear ended up writing a short book about it in uh the late 90s or early 2000s. Because the because of the occupants, right? And so, in in his book, I think he details some stuff like the the messages that were telepathically received by the entities, um, which is very interesting. But also, you know, you know, one of the gentlemen who retrieved the the entities because they were living at the time, yeah. uh, maybe got nicked, you know, by mm -hmm. the being when he's mm -hmm. carrying him, and. This is the doctor is on the record and everything that the the gentleman that that carried the being uh, who allegedly smelled kind of like ammonia to this the the into the into the car and then to the hospital or the military hospital or whatever it was within within a week and a half or so he he died of an of a very bizarre autoimmune immune disease and the doctors on the record saying like i'd never seen any kind of thing before or after that like this gentleman died from this interaction you know again because he was potentially scratched by the entity okay. and obviously i don't think it was intentional it was you know they it was just a, a side effect of exposure Interesting. Now, here's a question. You mentioned ammonia, right? Right, Associated right. Associated with the bodies themselves? I believe so. Okay. Yeah, in this case. So that's interesting because we just covered that 1954 case in New Mexico. When the helicopter landed, the photographer said that the whole area smelled like battery acid. Yeah, yeah. So maybe that's this pungent odor that these dead ET bodies or bodies start you know, it permeates the entire area. So that's kind of an interesting point that you mentioned that. Yeah. And um, again, at, at first, I think, well, I'm not sure if I'm, I'm trying to remember if, if uh, like maybe one of the ETs or entities, uh, non-human intelligence was deceased and one was alive. But, um, you know, allegedly there's there's video footage of these entities that James Fox has been trying to get a hold of. Yeah. And the the he allegedly knows where the tape is and the person really? <laughs> who may have it is basically scared for their life. Like he offered, he put up a thing saying, listen, I can donate a, a, a certain sum of money. And these, these people are really afraid. So are lives. the civilians yeah. that have the tape? Yeah, really? I believe so. Yeah. Okay. And they're still in uh, Brazil, right? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, James, you got to speak to James Fox because it's, it's a really intriguing case and he did an excellent investigation and, and documented what he could. Mm -hmm. And I, I know he's still trying to do more with, you know, as it goes, but you know, people are really, really afraid. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. I'm going to look into a little bit further. It'd be a nice one to have a little bit more of a modern case, right? Yeah, yeah, so there's Good. James Fox's um, film, Moment of Contact, Dr. Roger Lear, who who wrote a book on his investigation with that. So kind of both of those are probably two of the, the most, uh, the, the best sources to go with that for now. Good. Okay, great. And, uh, but again, I, you know, this, this topic, you know, with, with, especially with all the current events with David Grush coming forward and others, 
Um, and again, uh, potentially other people who have already put in dopsers and, and whistleblower complaints and who will be coming forward uh, potentially to talk about this, you know, crash retrievals publicly um, is incredibly important. And, you know, I've said the same thing before, and I'm, I'm sure others have in the past is, you know, this is the crown jewel of the thing. The this, this is, Absolutely. I mean, this is not lights in the sky or, you know, this is possession of, of hard physical evidence, um, you know, technology, hardware, no. biological material, or, you know, Absolutely. biologics. So this is, uh, this is it, man. I mean, if, if, if you, if that's out in the open, that's it. There's no, there's, that's, that's the, the big thing. All we need is one. We just need yeah. one. It's no, you know, it's, we only need one. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. So again, uh, thank you so much for all the work you do. You. Uh, thank you so much for coming on and, and I hope to have you on again sometime soon. Thank you so much. Great. All right. Take care, Michael. Take care. Yep. Bye.